from the Catholic underground. Today on the show, we relieve a little stress. We grade some papers. We put the Vatican on our hard drive. We we rethink the Catholic funeral. We tell you our picks of the week and so much more. The Catholic underground starts right now. All righty, folks. If you're listening from Wyoming, we'll still take you anyway. Uh, it's the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 263. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you indeed are listening live, you can catch us in the chat room at catholicunderground.tv. And joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He's the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. He's also uh, our self-appointed brisketeer. Father Ryan, how are you and the smoked meats of Natchitoches doing? Things are wonderful and smoky and delicious and just a hint of pepper. Perfect. Kathleen Lee joins us. She is a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge. It's almost summertime, but she's still the semi-pro faith ninja. Hey, Kathleen. How are you? I'm well. Good. And thank you for asking. We've also got Jeff Blackwell, our technical director of the Catholic Underground. He's the commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. Yes. Jeff. It's going to be here. I'm wearing my skinny jeans today. Oh, oh. my. Well, you know, he'll be there for a while. Uh, we, we also have uh, we also have Mary Kate Taylor, who is in the video cave, and Ed Ball, who is uh, helping out with video. And we even got some folks from Pieta Ministries who are who are auditing us today. So, so we're happy to have uh, really a, a house full. And um, and you know maybe as as a, a, a CU group we should get together and go to Boise Idaho to Das Break Room, Father, because uh, I don't know this sounds like a really cool idea to have a little bit of stress relief. Basically, you buy stuff and you break stuff, right? Wow. Yeah, this, this guy what he does is he has the space and you can go in and he's uh, he's got safety equipment you can you can rent. He's got this big room which is designed to take a lot of you know beatings and then he'll sell you <laughs> junk. You know, TVs, printers, anything that you hate, he'll sell it to you and then allow you to beat it to death with a hammer or a baseball bat or whatever seems good for you. Wow. And uh, it just seems like an awful lot of fun to me. I know. I'll put that stuff in a box and I'll mail that box to myself. And when it arrives, <laughs> I'll smash it with a hammer. But I have to right pay that. for it? Yeah. Oh, I don't you, know. You, pay, you pay a fee to, to go into the room. Uh, and and to rent the equipment, and then you pay. Uh, you can buy the junk off him separate. Now he does have happy hour daily, where you get a, a discount of of breaking. Uh, you get you can break all kinds of stuff. I guess at, at some kind of reduced rate. Now I I, I hey I, I like I'm in I'm in for a penny in for a pounding uh, here. You know just to to it's like laser tag, except you get a bat. Yeah. Now can you bring your own stuff to break? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, theoretically, you can. I, I think that, that something along the lines of it can't be toxic. Oh, um, so you no know, mutagen. Y- yeah, you, you can't bring compound X or anything like that, but otherwise you're fine. Well, that's that's a good thing. Kathleen, would you be in for this? Yeah, you know, actually, we, at our... Um, we did <laughs> We've some, done this. <laughs> yeah, we did something very similar to this for our seniors' wellness day. Um, they they took scales. They were talking about body image, and, and, and they took scales and smashed it. I've never seen so many angry young women before at inanimate objects it was and and well because you've had this experience would, would you say that it was a cathartic one? Oh, absolutely I, yeah. girls that you know they didn't even think they had problems with what they were what they were doing they were like that just felt good mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes mm-hmm. i think it's good just to hit stuff not people but now, stuff stuff now yeah. jeff jeff uh, how about do you like this idea have you have you actually ever destroyed a piece of uh, audio equipment? That I have. I have actually a television set oh. uh, that wouldn't behave itself. Of course, it was the old um, CRT type. And yeah. uh, was it one of those that was as big as the console that it was sitting in? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I knew um, it. I know the TV. And uh, and and um, it's a shotgun, isn't it? uh, you know, right to the screen, man. It's just like. Oh, was, oh, wow. So you took out yeah. the heavy artillery. Yeah, for- several times. <laughs> oh, was, it, was, it out, was it out back at the shed? <laughs> yeah, we lived in, uh, my family actually lived out in the sticks in uh, central Louisiana. So, uh, yeah, we took it out to the woods and put it to rest. That's wow. lovely. I, I don't know. I, I think that's a great idea. I, I don't, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I feel like I've had a little stress relief just talking about the thought of, of doing that. Well, you yeah, know? you know, every, every time we get together, we, Father Chris talks about the gremlins coming, you know, coming out through the equipment. So gremlins I think that love Catholic media. There might be mm. some some 
there, some yeah, use there, for this. There, there could. For us. If only the gremlins. We could just take the gremlins. Yeah. Know? And look, yeah. in storage, I've got some uh, old analog equipment that uh, we can uh, help you with your stress relief there, Father. That Anytime make, you're ready. That would make an awesome YouTube video. <laughs> it, would. it could even go viral. <laughs> Priest destroys equipment. Let's do that. I might get a phone call from, you know, somebody at the office. Uh, okay. Know. Well, well, Kathleen, you know, um, you probably are, are doing this already because I know that at, at St. Joseph Academy, where you go, uh, where you go, yeah, well, where I you go, teach. I go there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of technology in the classroom. Yeah, for about the last, I guess, 12, 13 years we've had, um, we've done, we've been a laptop-based school. Yeah. So we do everything. Is that the laptop you're on? Yes, it is. Oh, this is the one with the with the swivelly, mm-hmm. swirly uh, screen. Like it yeah. Is this. Oh, she's gonna show you. Look Whoa. at that. Ooh. Ooh. What? Yeah, that's ah. weird. Yeah. So they've got all this now. Now the, this is for the students have all their stuff, but mm-hmm. but do you as teachers have uh, specific stuff for uh, for grading and turning grading. in assignments? Because there's that stuff is is here now. Sure. Yeah. And you know, I know LSU. I know a bunch of the colleges. If you're um, if you are a laptop-based school, you probably use Moodle. Um, a funny word, but a great... Tell us what you really think. Father Ryan. <laughs> Father Ryan. I have, a friend who, I have a friend who codes Moodle. Oh. He writes like the code oh. for it. Yeah. It's it's just horrific. Anyway, yeah. continue. I'm sorry, but it's, it's such anyway, a rancid it's, it's piece of on- software. It's just important to know. Yeah. I hate it a lot. It's an online website where you know I, I have my classes and all my... All my students are in each class, and I can post assignments. I can give them a place to turn it in. Um, I can pull them off of, of Moodle and grade it and give it back to them. Um, mm. So it's pretty it's pretty nice. There are definitely probably some some better um, yeah some better applications out there. And and mm-hmm. and Father Ryan, some of these apps are um, are for mobile devices. Well, the the big push that's happening now is is the laptops were the start, but now it's the we want to go to tablet only yeah, kind right. of thing. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that's what I've been looking at for my school. And there are actually quite a lot of them that are trying to do different things. The, the smart board companies are all trying to kind of get you into their ecosystem and it's extremely expensive. And yeah. so what we're starting to see is a lot of other companies that are breaking out and doing apps that you basically the student uh installs the app on their computer teacher installs the app on their on their app uh, lap, uh, ipad and then you using their online service you sync it up and then the student submits homework the homework uh, like in, in the app we're recommending here it's it's called um remarkable mm-hmm. the the student types their paper in anything they want whatever app it, word pages whatever then they put that on the ipad and they click submit it goes through a plagiarism detector and it shows up on the teachers uh in a queue on the teacher's app wow. and then they grade the papers they, they're able to see grammar errors spelling errors uh, possible plagiarism they're able to see this came from wikipedia kind of thing and then they can read it they can make notes they can make comments they grade the paper and then it's there in the cloud and so mom and dad can sign in and see it and uh, it just it allows a kind of a syncing up that's not locked into the ecosystem of the smart board, you know, or the Magellan board or whatever kind of specific system the school was kind of using. If yeah. it's a Promethean board, then I think they should should do their their Greek history. You know, Prometheus wasn't he the fire bringer? Yeah. It and didn't go well. For I Prometheus. was going to say he was kind of a. <laughs> I wouldn't name a smart board that, especially if I'm trying to get you into my ecosystem. But uh, yeah, I really I think. Even though I wasn't a bad student in the sense that I didn't plagiarize, because I have, I think we can all agree, way too many original thoughts. Um, <laughs> but I probably would have gotten in trouble because, you know, especially in college, I quote heavily, you know. And yeah. I guess as long as you, you're doing a bibliography or, mm-hmm. or whatever. But well, those, those, those uh, algorithms that search for plagiarism don't actually, they're not, that's not problems with quotations. What they do is they're smart enough to know that something is inset, something is blocked, oh, gotcha. something is single quote, double quote. So if you're just it pulling even, large bits of text and pasting them in without doing anything else, it'll it'll right. it'll flag that. Well, what it what it'll actually do is it'll look for inline quotations that are not quoted. That's where it's really bad. So like if, if there's a if there's an entire paragraph that's not inset, it's not blocks, it's not block quoted, and and uh, and then there's one or two or three kind of little conjunctions in the middle, and there's no quotations. Then that thing knows he's trying to pass this off as his own work, 
And so most of these these filters have gotten extremely clever wow. in in being able to to cut through that. Because remember, basically all of our text documents now are XML documents, so it's no longer yeah. just RTF. And so there's a lot of stuff you can do with basically a nerd like me sitting on the end of it, going, <laughs> "I wonder what I'd do there." <laughs> <You know. laughs> Nerding yeah. it. I, I don't know. Right. Kathleen, does this make your job as a teacher more difficult or easier? Well, you know, what I'm thinking is, you know, this plagiarism checker, the the thing that flags, you know, spelling and grammar. I, I teach theology, and I'll be very honest. I loved English. I was strong in English and history, um, but I am not a grammar checker. I, I always tell my girls, I check for content. So put your effort in the content. And I, I probably ruin their English, you know, lessons because I say, I Look, just copy and paste the the web, the website you get it from. I don't need a whole bibliography. Their English teacher doesn't like I'm you. I'm single handedly, <laughs> yeah, um, destroying any English knowledge that our high school students are, you know, leaving high school with. And me, I'd be the opposite. I'd look for the grammar, yeah. and then I'd give the content a pass. But I see, think. if I <laughs> if right. I if I have that already done, especially for me, like if I have that already checked, and I can just go in and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's wrong. Um, mm. It's not the first thing I look for. Huh. You know, I'm with, you know. This year I have only have three classes, but I have fifty two girls. Mm. You know, with fifty two papers to wow. read, I'm not going to go That's back and read several times. Right. You know, so yeah. I think that this is great. You know, so Father Ryan, you're a non teacher. Yes. Uh, what What do you think about it? Well, I I think that as much as I don't personally have an affinity for doing stuff on iPads and, and mm -hmm. tablets the way that a lot of the kids do. It's very natural for them. I've, I've literally seen him watch uh, watch the kid type a five or six page paper on an iPad, and so I think that you know, the reality is that that's the direction we're going. Um, the reality is that I'd I'd rather see them get a newly updated textbook every year for the same price uh, as I can buy a big expensive one that's going to be outdated next week. And so I like the yeah. idea of using an iPad curriculum. And I think this is just another step in the process. Now, I don't think that Remarkable is the only one out there. I think there's a bunch of apps, but it's just interesting to watch as this market kind of starts to stabilize in the next two or three years, because of course I'm, I'm the, the president, the, the provost, the, the uh, chancellor of a school. And so I'm looking at this closely for seeing what we're going to do, you know, at my school, we've already started using Duolingo. So we're not afraid of using, you know, web apps that are not necessarily big, big money, you know, kind of thing. So who knows? Yeah, um, I suppose we can say time will tell, but the time is, well, the time is now, and these things are in school. So uh, so maybe you're a teacher. Let us know what you think if you're using one of these apps, uh, or is it making your life easier, or is it making things more difficult? Backchat at catholicundergroundcom is uh, is the place to go. It's the email uh, to to uh, comment. Or you can, of course, always go to facebook.com slash catholicunderground and let us know uh, in the com box there on, on the, uh, the Facebook you are listening to The Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv, and I am Father Chris Decker. Father Ryan Humphreys joins me from Natchitoches, Louisiana. Jeff Blackwell is on the big soundboard. Kathleen Lee, Mary-Kate Taylor, and Ed Ball, whom you do not see, but we know they are here. It's kind of a faith thing. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later, uh, but first we're going to be go from the beginning of life to the other end, ever plans... I'm, I'm not kidding you. Everplans stores your end-of-life documents and securely shows them to the people you want to see them. And uh, for our for our embalming expert, we go to Father Ryan. <laughs> Digital <Ew>. embalming. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. the, yeah. the actually end-of-life documents is one of those things that, that more and more um, people are asking questions about because it used to be fairly easy to die. And now it's you got to redo paperwork before you're allowed to. Um, and so it really is kind of a bigger deal than it seems. You know, who who is going to be your medical proxy and how are they going to get that information? And if you update that information, how are they going to know what you want to do? The same thing with your will, the same thing with your legal power of attorney, the same, same thing with your estate documents, uh, all your different deeds and things like that. It's extremely confusing. And so even if you know what you need in terms of all the papers, it's difficult to figure out how to get them all in order and how to let your different executors Mm -hmm. know about those things. Because what I certainly don't want to do is I don't want to call the executor of my will, Father Chad Partain, and say, here's the password to my computer and here's the password to my phone and here's the password to my email address. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd rather not just, you know, let him know all those things. Um, and so whatever uh, Everplans intends to do is one, it'll guide you through all the documents. A checklist you need. type of thing, I'd imagine. Yeah, because they're like 18. Yeah. And there's well, a lot. Hmm. 
Um, and then after it's guided you through, it'll store those for you. It'll allow you to upload some extra ones if you've already done some on your own. And it allows you to give access selectively to those documents to other people. And of course, there's a, a for pay version if you want the fancier and extra stuff. But really, it, it gives you all the stuff you need so that when you do die, you're able to leave your affairs, quote unquote, in order, um, which is really an, an enormous benefit for others because, I mean, this can take four, five, six years yeah. of, of your children's lives and massive attorney fees. And that's just, that's just not, it's not good, especially mm. if you're a priest, you're leaving that then for the people of the diocese to pay for. And that's, that's almost uh, sinful. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, folks always uh, say, well, well, doesn't the diocese just take care of everything uh, on your death? And I said, well, no, no, not really, actually. We're responsible for having our affairs, if you will, in order. We're responsible for having our Knights of Columbus insurance to pay for our funeral and that sort of thing. Um, but I could see, you know, I think off the cuff we might say, oh, well, this is morbid, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to do all of this stuff, and I'm, I'm going to go through this process, and I'm not even dead yet. Just doing it makes me think about, well, gee, what's it going to be like when I'm dead? Um, but on the other hand, this is, uh, to me, this is a very good exercise. Um, it's a way that perhaps we wouldn't think of using the digital continent as Catholics, but it's a way that's very important because, as St. Benedict tells us, we should keep death always before us. Why? Because it's going to happen. And so I think this is a good idea, besides the fact that it has an obvious advantage to those who come after you who have to try and piece everything together from your estate. Yeah. Jeff, uh, how about yeah? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I was going to say that uh, the uh, we as Catholics are preparing our soul, yeah, uh, for that time yeah. when we're no longer living, breathing human beings, and and uh, you know, having gone through this uh, this the experience, and I yeah. know that a lot of listeners and viewers uh, have the same thing. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff after the fact that you have to take care of. Not only just the final arrangements, uh, but uh, um, there were instances where. Bank accounts, um, yeah. you know, credit accounts that you have to, to, to settle or, um, uh, you know, hospital bills, things like that. Right. So, um, yeah, this is a great idea. And, oh, as a side note, yeah. uh, Father Ryan, I don't know if you've heard about the smart headstones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Is there like a QR code on Tombstone? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh. Yeah. They so you scan it and you get QR a little code. note. From the deceased, oh, photos, or YouTube video recordings. Yeah, it's mostly mostly YouTube videos, or uh, or sometimes they'll host like an audio file. It's, it's so there's somebody video. looking ahead. <laughs> if you're watching this, it means that I have died in a freak gasoline fight accident. Yeah. So make sure yeah. that you take all of my stuff and put it in a cave. Yeah. I, there, yeah. Uh, so we will do that. Down by the river. <laughs> down Circa Del Rio. <laughs> But it is. It's a Del Rio. That's uh, <laughs> it's an important detail. Uh, but it's, it's a great uh, idea that you know, this part of that yeah. uh, preparation for you know your your demise. So uh, I, I think it's good, Kathleen. The, the, that's gross. You're going to die. What? <laughs> One of these I'm like my dad. My dad <laughs> says that he's like I'm never going to die. I'm like what? Oh, you and Commander Riker yeah. going to live forever? That's yeah. unceremoniously and, and un unquestionably <laughs> incorrect. <laughs> that's right. <sighs> I don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> as somebody who's never <laughs> going to die, Debbie Downer, <laughs> they never did find out a way to stop death, <laughs> uh, except Jesus. Jesus, you know, he won. Yeah, he did. He won the victory. Um, so, but yeah, as somebody who's kind of freaked out by this dying thing, yeah, um, you know, I never really. Uh, not that I have an issue with death. Um, I I am as uncomfortable with death as the next person. Um, I don't really think about it. You know, the, you know, there's those times when you can't sleep yeah. and thoughts like that pop in your head and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> there's so, going to be a time where you. I'm no longer here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think about it that much. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how I would, you know, I would plan for that. I, I imagine that when you start a family, that, that that's when you start looking at things like that. Yeah. Um, or when you just get older. Yeah. But Kathleen, <laughs> you could be in a freak gasoline fight accident anytime. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Right. I, I like have you this. Ever, have you ever had an orange mocha chino? I mean, orange, orange, orange mocha frappuccino, can, or, or, Kathleen. Or frappuccino. Yeah, that's that's how it quick. starts. That's the drink, gateway beverage. I don't drink coffee. Before you know it, you've had an orange mocha frappuccino and you're in a freak gasoline <laughs> fight accident. That's right. Nice. Listening to Wham. <laughs> yeah. Riding oh, an open top no. Jeep in California. That's right. <laughs> Jeff, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, it can happen to anybody. 
anybody. At any time. <laughs> at any time. More right. meaningful that way. It is. Like, that goes. That goes yeah. to shit. Bet you didn't even that know goes. what your googly was. Anyway, we go from death to the library. What a transition. It's you close like enough. that? I like close that. Close enough. <laughs> so, the Vatican Library, um, speaking of uh, tomes and tomes and tomes of things that dead people have written, the Vatican Library is beginning a 100-year project, so we'll be dead by the time it gets done, to Set scan... Me. And archive its entire collection. Wow. Its entire collection. So, according to the experts, uh, it should take about four years for every 3,000 pages that, uh, that the Vatican Library scans. Um, they're using special scanners and special handling techniques and, and a whole pile of hard drives. It might look like my editing suite, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> Father Ryan has seen it. Um, and so they're expecting to use, get this, 40,000 terabytes. That, I don't, what's a petabyte? Is that in anywhere near? Yeah, that would be 40 petabytes. 40 petabytes of data, um, which will probably fit on a digital watch by the time they're done with the project. You know, isn't that something? Yeah. Um, and in, in 100 years, I would imagine that we will have data, 40,000 terabytes, just on a small uh, thumb drive. I bet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's see. Uh, the cost for the first round of scans uh, is going to be about twenty-five million dollars, and each successive four-year round will become a little bit cheaper. You know, by volume. Hmm. Um, so here's the question: Why spend time and money on a five hundred-year-old letter from from you know Saint Bobbert of Middleworth? Uh, why Why would we do this, Father Ryan? This is just part of who we are, right? Yeah, I think it's our heritage. You know, I mean, yeah. so much of, of what the Vatican has is art and it has this history. And people say, oh, you could sell this and give to the poor. But but the but the church says, look, this is this is our heritage. It's not designed. It's not wealth. It's 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 what made us who we are. And it, this is what you know, this is what the church did when Rome fell. You know, we, we saved and preserved all these things. And this is just the next step in preserving them. Because eventually the paper is going to dissolve. Eventually, yeah. uh, the books will no longer hold their cohesion, and so we need to find some way to to keep this part of our human heritage together. And so, yeah, it, it's it's our legacy. It's it's what God has given us through history. That's right. And and did you know, you can uh, look on the Vatican's <clears throat> updated website. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a whole nother show. I like it. Uh, you can As look on the, on the Vatican's updated website. Um, there is a, a, a papal commission for the cultural patrimony of the church. And uh, the, the notion, of course, is, is that we must preserve culture, especially the culture of the church, because we know that those who preserve culture are the ones who define culture, you see. And so it, the church really, because she is who she is, and all, all culture that has ever been and will ever be, in a sense, passes through her. Um, she really is kind of like a, um, uh, kind of a, I don't really, like, like, well, if I can use a crude term, she's like a pool filter, you know? All of the, all of the important things that happen kind of stick to the walls of Mother Church, and she records them and, and makes sure that they're there for posterity so that others can look back and see ultimately in Scripture the reason for our hope, the reason for our joy, the things that happened that that uh, that brought crucifixion in our society, the things that happened that brought great joy and redemption in our society. And uh, if you remember, of course, in World War II, a lot of what now Saint John Paul II is known for is preserving the culture of Poland. He wrote plays, he uh, wrote poetry, he he wrote and performed extensively, and he did this not just because he was an artist but because he knew that to preserve authentic culture is to preserve a people. And I think that this is an important thing. Uh, I just hope, I, I'm wondering if they're going to make it public. You know, some of this stuff would be great to be able to, to search through it on the internet. The, the word is that once they've got the, the scan complete, then they'll do a, a lower quality version for the web mm -hmm. uh, for people to see. And it will become obviously some kind of extremely complicated, large website. But you're talking about still huge quantities of data. So... You know, it's it's Italy. It may be done in yeah. 50, yeah. 60, 80 but, years. Yeah, that's why yeah. it's a 100-year plan. Years yeah. in the making, sure. <laughs> Listen, it's about 99 years uh, since we said we were going to do that plan. So maybe we should start, I don't know, maybe after the, the uh, the you know, the reposo. We, we rest, then we do it, okay? Okay. I think. If this was the United States, we'd be done by March mm -hmm. yeah. next year. Yeah. You know, but this is Italy, so we're looking at about 100 years. Because, you know. We think in centuries. We're the church. 
Yeah. That's right. And and there's red wine to be had. Yes. You know, so. And gelato. Why well, right. you can't get hurried. In you know, vino hurried. scanitas. Yeah, you are, in fact, listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker, sitting to my left, your right, uh, Kathleen Lee. We've got uh, Father Ryan Humphreys, who is uh, always on deck, and he's usually good for a laugh. Uh, Jeff Blackwell is at the audio board. We've got Mary-Kate Taylor and Ed Ball on the video thingamajig. And, uh, and we, we are being audited, as we said earlier, by the folks from Pieta Ministries. They're, uh, they're sitting in, watching how we do what we do, and hopefully they lack of what they see. So, um, yeah, that's who we are. And uh, we're going to go right back to funerals for a moment, um, <laughs> if I we love may. dead things. <laughs> Great. You should see his garden. There's just nothing live. Out there. It's, all, it's all wilted. <laughs> Only kind of cabbage he likes. Wilted. Spinach, <laughs> wilted. Yeah. Anyway. Morticia Adams is my favorite character. Oh, Indeed. man. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. So, funerals, Father. Yeah, so uh, I came across an article by uh, a musician named Andrew Moitka, who said that one of the best things that he has done in his parish and that we should all do is we should use funerals as examples for liturgical reform. You know, when I first read the headline, I was like, gosh, use a funeral? I mean, that's 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 just morbid and sad and you yeah. know, kind of dirty. I mean, we're trying to <laughs> bury somebody and try to help the family mourn, and then some jerk wants to use the funeral for some self-serving purpose. But it was a really amazing article because he pointed out we can really give no greater gift to the dead and to those who are mourning than a mass, you know, yeah. doing it well, really offering it to God beautifully. And he said, when you offer the mass beautifully and it's accompanied by a sermon that does not say grandma is already in heaven, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the mass starts to make sense and it starts to become something that, that it allows us to express our grief and express our sorrow. And it really became a, a kind of a beautiful thing. And it, it moved me because, you know, funerals and weddings are when fallen away Catholics are likely to be in church. It's yeah. when you have a captive audience, it's when they're less ideological. It's when they're less concerned about the watch, making sure you're ex out in exactly 28 minutes or exactly 58 minutes. And so his argument is that we ought to put aside eagle's wings and amazing grace mm -hmm. uh, and let, let, the, let the house happen at the wake, do them at the burial, whatever. But for the mass, let the church's liturgy speak for itself. And he said, do the in paradisum. Do it in English, do it in Latin, who cares? Do the, the dies irae. Do it in English, do it in Latin, who cares? But let the musical patrimony of the church really speak. Yeah. And these people who are trying to mourn can then receive what the church is really trying to offer them and not just some kind of sugary syrup that's meant to make us feel better until we go home. Yeah. When it, and then when it finally hits, of course, we have nothing to help us. You know, you know I, we're on our own there and all we can do is eat haagen -Dazs, Whereas if we allow the wound to really be open in the church, yeah. then God is there to help. And so it really is an act of love and not, you know, uh, uh, an act of, of, of anything else to try to help those people open that wound up and let them mourn in the church instead of waiting until all they've got helping them is haagen -Dazs and snuggles. Yeah, and, and I'll snuggles. tell you, uh, I'll tell you a little secret. Ready? I'm kind of doing that now. Uh, because I have found, just through, through my own trial and error, if you will, uh, that you are right 100%, and, and I think that, um, that, uh, that Andrew is correct as well, this is a time when many people who have fallen away from the faith, who don't have an experience of the church, or more than likely, if they're fallen away, who have kind of a sentimental notion of what church was like when they were young, uh, they come in sometimes with these preconceived notions that the Mass is going to be like it was when Grandma took them. And, uh, and so I often will say, you know, um, because it's, it's kind of a big thing in my parishes to do, to read the eulogy or rather to read the obituary, uh, at the mass. Mm. And like there, there's been this notion that the mass doesn't really count unless the obituary is read. Wow. And, and so that. I've shifted that rather than the obituary kind of taking the place of where the, uh, the, the eulogy ordinarily is permitted. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let's do all of that stuff. Uh, at the visitation before the funeral mass. So if there are eulogies, if, if there are other ministers of other faiths that are there for the funeral, as is very common in my area, uh, if, if there are obituaries and things to be read, let's do all of that before that point, before the mass begins, so that we can then let the liturgy speak for itself. Because the liturgy is the time really for us to, to simply allow the readings, to allow the homily, 
to allow even the Eucharistic prayer to wash over us, you know, and and in the same way that um, that whenever you have an open wound, uh, as as the grief of, of someone dying often is, uh, we we want that wound to be to be soothed, right? And sometimes that involves cauterizing it, you know, it involves a little pain, and so I tell uh, folks, you know, crying during the funeral is very very okay. Um, being angry during the funeral is very, very okay, but but let's not try and shift the focus back on ourselves. Mm. Let's yes. let's allow the Lord to minister to us through the words, the timeless words of the liturgy, and and I have found more than more often than not when I've done what uh, folks might consider a a traditional thing, like I simply sing uh, in plain chant the um, the the prayers of farewell over the casket as I incense it. And uh, it's been five years in the parish, and and the parishioners, now they sing their response. They know it, and and it's kind of it takes the place of the imperadisum, and uh, and and it's really a healing thing. And that's usually whenever they'll start to cry and 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 begin to process some of this stuff that's been open during the liturgy is when the casket is being incensed that final time. Yes. And I've found that that's been a really uh, beautiful, if if I can say, um, laboratory. Uh, but I, I use it in the most reverent way possible, that the funeral can be a source. And I know people who have come back to church because a funeral spoke to them, and not because we tried to make the funeral speak, you know, using our stuff. Right. So, <laughs> end of homily. <laughs> Go in peace. Good word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I don't know, Jeff, uh, you, you've known uh, quite a few funerals. You know, you've had, you've had uh, family members and, and parents also who have gone to the Lord. Yes. And and um, I always get the sense that funerals are are it, it may sound weird, but funerals are kind of special to you. I get that sense. Yes, as difficult as they are, right? And um, I, I mentioned last week I'm a 24 year old Catholic, um, and uh, the uh, my uh, actually my wife's uh, father passed away quite suddenly, and I was asked to um, to be a commentator, and. Um, at his funeral, but I, uh, and I was, I was a pretty fresh Catholic then. Yeah, and yeah. I told my wife, I said, you know, that was the, the most special funeral I have ever witnessed and attended in my life. And that's the way I want to go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's, um, it's, and, uh, and that's what I've found is that whenever, whenever someone attends a funeral that is, that is well done, right. That is beautiful. Um, in and of itself, they will often say that that's what I want. And it's yeah. it's less because there's also another line. I don't know if you hear this, Father Ryan. There's I don't want to be a bother to anybody, and so they say I'd like the lowest common denominator funeral, no mass, just the readings, just the bare minimum, because I don't want to be a bother. But what I found is that when people experience a beautiful funeral mass, mm-hmm. they say that that's where I want my casket. I want my casket in the center of that. You know, right? Yeah. It's important. It is very. Well, and, and and part of that too is if people believe they're already going to heaven, then they don't. Then they, yeah, you know, and that's that's one of those things that's challenging because everybody else is saying, "Well, Mama's in heaven now," and you don't want to be the giant jerk who says, "Well, no, she's not," you know, because she might be in heaven. Mm-hmm. But it's it's a very difficult situation, and of course, it's it's terrible for the soul yeah. because now nobody's praying for them. Everybody's right. just happy and they're they're patting yeah. each other on the back and saying it's okay. You know, and that soul, if they could come up out back into their body and raise up, they'd go, you goofballs, stop saying <laughs> oh. that and start praying for me. Yeah. You know, because even if they are in heaven, they want to see people grow in holiness. And, you know, so so as more and more people fall into that error that everybody goes to heaven when they die, the more we simply don't care about funerals. And so I think that, like, you're right, Father Chris, the more we show in the funeral that what we're doing matters. Yeah the more we're correcting the theology, that Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi thing, it's a back and forth. You yeah. Know? And, uh, and of course, you could probably do a whole other show on the importance of doing that in weddings. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> but Big, boy, oh boy, <laughs> can I tell you, if I got to hear the prayer or any more Angelo Bocelli, I'm, I'm going to have a moment. That guy, not okay. <laughs> he, he's not always not welcome. <laughs> hey, you're not welcome here. Maybe if he's <laughs> on droids, Latin. Droids, droids go outside. <laughs> no droids here. These are not the Bocellis you're looking for. <laughs> so, They're really not. So, uh, so from death back to the beginning of life. Um, Kathleen, you're a teacher. 
I think yes, maybe yes, I we can both speak to this. Uh, uh, seven things that our parents are missing. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and this is uh, this is the the importance of thinking liturgically. Yeah. Um, just just within within the way that we live, right? L- liturgically, I guess Father Ryan, meaning that uh, that we need to be very intentional about what we do, right? Right, and and the, this this list comes from the beginning of an entirely separate article, you know, about thinking liturgically and about yeah. thinking more broadly. And it's really fascinating because this list didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense with the article, but it turned out to be the best part of the whole thing. Yeah. So it's a really good list. And because we like lists, we, we thought we'd go lists. through. We, <laughs> we love we the love list, lists. my friends. Love the list. So we think we go through the list with you. Uh, number one, they don't understand their faith well enough to pass it on to any children they may have. This is a common thing. Mm-hmm. I hear from from uh, maybe a baby boomer Catholic or maybe even now a millennial that's beginning to have children is, well, I don't really understand my faith, so uh, I'm just I don't know how to I don't know how to pass that on, you know. And yeah. uh, do you do you find this maybe with some of our contemporaries now? Yeah, I I always say that you know some of the the biggest understandings in the church are because people just don't know, you know, obviously, but like you know, people hate. Or disagree or, or hate things that they don't even yeah. under, fully understand. Right. Yeah. I don't understand why the church does that, so I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of my kids who are who are coming to my three year old and four year old and five year old program at St. Mary's, the parents are sending them and they're saying, "Yeah, we're we're sending them here because we love St. Mary's, but we're sending them here because we, we're basically just passing off that obligation yeah. to provide yeah. religious you education." Teach them. Yeah. And, and hey, God bless them for it. If if you if I look at myself and I say I'm not qualified. You know, but that's one of the things our, our parents really need to, we need to, to be able to give them the faith in a way that they're able to pass it on to their children. Otherwise, we, we're just doing it, we're doing triage one generation at a time. Yeah, which, which never really works. You, you no. can't ever catch up to that. Number two, uh, they're unable to articulate a coherent case for what it means to be Catholic. Uh, this is, of course, I think also why um, there are growing numbers of Catholics who are getting interested in apologetics and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, because so many that, that I encounter, um, especially now older Catholics, they say, I want to articulate why I'm Catholic. I come to church, but I, I really want to begin to understand why I do what I do uh, outside of church, you know, and, and that's, that's a really important thing. Um, I know, Jeff, have you, have you been involved in any apologetic stuff before? I uh, had not, and in fact, when I first heard the term apologetics, it confused me. It's like, what are we apologizing for? Uh, but uh, that, uh, of course, I, I learned that that is not uh, the meaning of uh, apologetics. Right. So, uh, but um, uh, just listening through, uh, you know, Catholic radio, Catholic yeah. media, yeah. I have learned a lot, and uh, cont- and I can't hear it enough. I love to soak it up, and uh, mm-hmm. be- because uh, coming from a, a, Pro- a Protestant background. There, they were always, you know, they'd have tracks to push in your hand, uh, to push in other people's hands, and you know, you're going to hell, and uh, for various yeah. and sundry reasons. But yeah, yeah, exactly. But and and then I, as I became Catholic, realized a lot of that stuff that I had heard was, you know, t- about Catholics was totally false, mm-hmm. and that led me to actually be- become Catholic. Because wait a minute, I, I, what happened when you know after Jesus? was crucified, yeah. rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. Where did the church go from there? And and not only that, but why? Why things happen? So that's uh, inter-apologetics. Uh, and in fact, I just ordered a book. Uh, I believe the, the name of it is Why Catholics Are Right. Yeah. Um, Michael Cohen. Yeah. Michael yeah, Michael Corrin. Cohen. Corrin, Corrin, that's right. So uh, I, I've uh, heard things from that book. So I just, I'm trying to, you know, amplify that the apologetics of my life. Yeah, well, And, you know, I think one of the reasons it's so difficult is because so many of the Protestants nowadays, you know, not, not your classic Lutheran or Methodist, but so many of your modern Protestants uh, are, you know, the answer is, well, why, why are you Baptist? Why are you Methodist? You say, well, I like this church or I like the pastor or my family goes there or I have friends there or it's a welcoming community or I like the band or I'm dating the musician or I work the soundboard or, mm-hmm. you know, the, the answer is something that's generally disconnected from anything about worshiping Jesus Christ. Right. And maybe the answer is it would, I feel near to God, but it's almost always this hyper personal. Yeah. And GK Chesterton ultimately said, people look up and he asks, and he goes, I don't have a good answer for him except to say it is the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and, and it's, it's somewhat difficult to make a cohesive case 
for Catholicism, you know, to have that elevator pitch, yeah. um, you know, and, and frankly, it's the responsibility of the church to give you that elevator pitch and yeah. not to expect you to, you know, to figure it out on your own. I mean, that's just, so, so in this case, the church has failed us for the last 50 years, I think, to adequately give, you know, the simple, clear case for why I'm a Catholic. Yeah, and, and I mean, that falls upon the shoulders of, of the priests and the catechists, certainly, yes. um, to be able to do. In fact, that's why I often say, and you hear me say it on the show, uh, I would say 90% of the homilies I give are, are catechetical in nature. Mm. They're, they're teaching homilies, if you will, uh, because that's where we are. We, we need to be able to give a coherent case for what it means to be Catholic. For example, um, the, uh, the road to Emmaus, uh, basically that, that whole story, um, that's the Mass, you're walking along, you're walking along, you're minding your own business, Jesus comes up behind <laughs> you. He uh, he starts uh, explaining what the readings mean. He starts uh, with the uh, the Old Testament with Moses and the prophets, and he goes all the way through to till himself, till the gospel himself. And then, uh, just when you think that he's about to go on farther, you ask him to stay with you and the Eucharist. And as Jeff pointed out so well today, uh, you were talking about how you were surprised that there was a line that, that stood out yeah. that you hadn't seen before. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, uh, in today's gospel. Yeah, and that line was? That line was that, uh, you know, Jesus broke the bread. Yep. He gave handed it, it, gave it out, and, and then disappeared. That's right. And I had never heard or actually paid attention to that in all my years. To which I told Jeff, he didn't disappear right. because he stayed right there. Yay! <laughs> Eucharist. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, that, that kind of a homily, to be able to explain that sort of thing. Yes. So people can take that home and go, oh, wow, and then begin to unpack it in their own uh, discussions at home. Or, oh, gosh, are we only on number two? Number three, um, they believe that their own subjective beliefs and experiences are a more important arbiter of truth than the church. It's what I like to call the church of the bubble. You know, mm. the bubble that I happen to exist in right now. My little personal defense field. Yes. That's the most important uh, truth. And, well, I think we can all agree that eh, eh. doesn't take much to puncture that bubble. <laughs> right. No, it's pretty weak. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, number four, they pick and choose what they want to believe, discarding the parts they dislike. Uh, in particular, the teaching on uh, sexuality and sexual morality. Um, Kathleen, this is what oh, we call yes. cafeteria Catholicism. Ah, oh, yes. A little buffet line. Mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. yeah. Preach on and we have to realize just how big of a deal this is when parents do this mm-hmm. because it it, insp- it instills in their children an idea that this is just one kind of ethical system that is designed to give you a vague sense of satisfaction. And so whenever you want to go outside of it, feel free to go outside of it. And so when parents are doing this, they're actually causing huge amounts of damage. Um, you know, and, and it's not just in sexuality, but it's it's a really, really big deal when a parent embraces cafeteria Catholicism because, you know, it, it gives the basic foundational understanding of faith that their child is going to have it is going to be broken from minute one. And it's going to take that child a lifetime to repair that kind of fundamental philosophical way of looking at the world. So it's a really giant thing, yeah. you know, for parents to try to fight against this temptation. And then another temptation to, to fight against, uh, they're, they're less involved with the church as an institution, I, I, e.g. they don't go to Mass often, and they feel more loosely tied to it than previous Catholic generations. There once was a time, um, and, and this isn't just looking to the halcyon days of the 50s or 40s or 30s, uh, there once was a time when more or less the church was the center of, of life. You know, um, everything that you did as a family spoke from your involvement in the church. And now, would you say, Father, that um, that those spokes are becoming centralized in other places, especially like youth sports? Well, I think what's actually happened is that the spokes have just become disconnected. Yeah. And and yeah. you just try to hop, you know, a la Star Wars, you know, lightsaber battle mm-hmm. from random, you know, pathway to random pathway. And you just hope to God you don't slip, yeah. you know, because there's nothing really that creates cohesion in life, um, you know, which I think is why the divorce rate is so sky high, because... You know, there's just nothing that sends like everything kind of comes back to this. So, yeah. so yeah, a lot of these young Catholics are, are disconnected Catholic parents from the institutional church. And because of that, they're trying to live Catholicism, which is a religion, yeah. as if it were a spirituality, uh-huh. you know, and, and it doesn't work. You can't have a purely spiritual Catholicism because Catholicism is sacramental and sacramental means church. That's right. So, it certainly yeah. does. Yeah. I had a, a person call me recently. Um, and uh, the person said, uh, Father, I'm not, uh, I grew up Catholic, but now I'm just straight Christian. (laughs) 
Like, I don't, okay, I don't exactly know what that means, but I think I have an <laughs> idea where you're going. Uh, and, and they had a question about, uh, about cremation. And they said, well, I can't find this in the Bible anywhere. And, and I'm really, really worried because that's what I want. And, and my first thought was, well, okay, well, wh- why are you calling a priest to ask me my, quote, opinion, unquote, on cremation? So I had to explain, you know, well, if you grew up Catholic, you know about the Bible, but you also probably know about sacred tradition from which the Bible comes, you know. Uh, out of that sacred tradition, God inspired the writers to, to compile the Bible and this and that. And, and I said, so cremation in this sense is, is permitted as long as you believe this and this and this about the body, about the resurrection and whatnot. And the person was very grateful, but I was thinking to myself, well, if you, di- if you didn't just see that, like, this kind of Catholic, uh, ethereal Catholicity that you once knew as a spirituality— and you were really plugged into the the church as visible institution of Christ. This wouldn't even be a thing. Yeah. You would you wouldn't be crying right now, you know. And and of course, I didn't say that. Obviously, you do have to uh, certainly uh, guide someone along in that time of, uh, of of really panic. But yeah, that's what happens whenever the church ceases to be a religion and just becomes a church of uh, whatever I want it to be at the moment, you know. So yeah, uh, let's see, uh, they tend to believe that the Catholic Church is just one church among others with no special claim to the truth. This is kind of like what we were talking about just now. Um, as, as Catholics, we certainly believe that uh, this is the church that Jesus intended, the church that he founded. If it wasn't, then he wouldn't have walked along with those disciples on the road to Emmaus. He wouldn't have given them the Eucharist and then, quote, disappeared, unquote. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, he would have just done a whole bunch of different things all over the world and said, whichever one of these you like, do that. But no, he took bread. He said, do this. Yes. He took wine. He said, do this. Um, and then finally, they affirm a Catholic identity, but reserve the right to define that as they want to. Plus, they see their Catholicism not as being the center of their identity, but one facet among others. I will bet, Kathleen, that you see this a little bit. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And my students, have, you know, of course, it's not, they don't, you know, I, somebody once said, you know, we put Jesus in line with all the other things that we do. You yeah. know, I am a, you know, a soccer player. I am a daughter. But he is a part of every one of those things in our life. Mm-hmm. And we don't often, we don't often do yeah. that. Or, or furthermore, to see, uh, as we talked about spokes instead of just bases that you're jumping to, uh, that, that everything that I do first mm-hmm. comes to me from that, that central experience of, of who I am as a Catholic as a follower of Jesus Christ in the church that we believe that he founded. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that really, ordering things in that way can actually begin to bring a great vitality to the way that we live. Because, Father, I mean, one of the things that, that as a priest I know perhaps you and I try to do the most is, is to try to convince folks, if convince is the right word, that to live as a Catholic is to live a fully integrated life. Yeah, the, the, the general idea in the world is... I wake up, I decide what I'm going to do. I've got a plan for my life. And then I figure out the stuff that I want to put in it. Yeah. You know, maybe I want to lose weight. Maybe I want to get holy this week. But the the basic premise of Jesus is you're either going to burn in hell for all eternity or you're going to go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, you're going to do it my way. If you don't, you're going to burn in hell. And that's just the way it is. And so it's, it's like Jesus is laying out a path. And in the modern world, I'm supposed to lay out my own path. And if those paths are not the same, it's not going to be okay. Right. And so for the Catholic, we have to abandon the notion that I know what's best for my life and get on board with the path of Christ. And that is contrary to a lot of, you know, most things. And of course, you know, we've got uh, parents are doing this to their kids saying, you can do anything. What do you want to do with your life? But they're not saying what has Christ given you? What does Christ want you to do with your life? And how are you going to work out your way to get to heaven? You know, I mean, this, the, the motto of my school, we've kind of changed. Uh, you know, it used to be all about unity. And now it's ad chevo mod collegium, to heaven and to college. That's mm. what we're here to do. And, you know, if you're not planning to get to heaven, then you're basically deciding all along the way that you want to go to hell. It's a big yeah. problem. Mm. Which is a problem. Maybe, Father, just don't melt cheese all over everything. Maybe not. Good place Maybe to start. Not. You know? Yeah, it's something. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, well, yeah, let us know what you think, as you always do. You have thoughts? Why don't you tell us them? Backchat at catholicunderground.com is the way to do it. But right now, we're going to go to that part of the show that you newcomers might know as... The CU Pick of the Week. And for our CU Pick of the Week, we first are going to go over to Kathleen because I like her Pick of the Week. 
Today we're going to talk about cutting the cheese. <laughs> yes. <You've> been- <laughs> yes, we are. You had nothing better to do. You sat at your desk earlier today and you made this joke up, didn't you? Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. You did. I'm working on it. This is a shout out to my uh, to my peeps. Your fellow Ms. cheese cutters. Uh, well, sitting in Miss Hale's backyard this afternoon, we had a lovely dinner put uh, on by some of our seminarians, Brad and Ryan. Yeah. And uh, we discussed, you know, they had a myriad of cheeses mm-hmm. and they had all these, you know, these cheese knives out there. And they all have, you know, some of them have these little fork things on the end. Yeah. Some have holes, which I, I didn't see any there tonight, but I did find out why they have holes. And these cheese knives are both functional. Mm hmm. And ornate. Mm. So. Like a chalice should be. Yes. And so for many years, I've looked at these cheese knives, you know, and, and said, what the heck? We just cut just cut it. We just need a knife. <laughs> I just but, want the cheese. Yeah. But well, the one that we were discussing had, you know, these little fork things. And we we're like, what is this? Well, apparently you cut the cheese and you flip the knife over, take the little fork, and you serve the cheese to your guests. What? Mm. Yeah, That's yeah. simple. Yet that lovely. And, and the holes are made so that the cheese doesn't stick to the knife. For years, I've been using the wrong cheese knives. And there you go. Man. Now I've found several you know, websites, which I have posted, we'll post in our show notes, um, on the appropriate <laughs> knives how for the appropriate the she, kind of cheese. She's found cheeses. <laughs> and how, in fact, to cut your own cheese. I love that. She's so, found cheeses. <laughs> if you want to cut the cheese, I'll show you how. <laughs> That, my friends, is quite possibly the best infomercial on the CU Pick of the Week uh, that we've ever, ever had. Uh, it's been a good day. <laughs> Tell you what. Jeff, top that. I can't. Uh, <laughs> I do have uh, two picks of the week. Uh, number one. Now, Father, you need to tell um, our listeners and uh-huh. viewers. Yeah. Uh, Father Chris gave me a button, which I'm wearing on my lapel here. Yeah. I have, uh, Jeff is, is part of uh, Starfleet Academy's engineering course. There you go. It might be an extension course, but yeah. yeah. You got <laughs> your button there. You go. uh, my pick of the week is um, a, a new app that I found. Uh, what had happened, and I'm, I rarely let my iPhone you know, run down battery-wise, but uh, I had a couple of long days this week, and it, I mean, it got down to like 10%. And um, uh, there is a... Um, I won't mention her name, but uh, she has a, her own radio show. Uh, and it's about computers and technology and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. But she had a, a YouTube uh, video about how you can say, and when your battery starts running low, how to save power. Um, and it, it's kind of obvious stuff. You know, turn down the brightness. Um, uh, turn off all the apps that are running in the background. Um, and if uh, if it's really critical, don't use any bright colored wallpaper. Go to a darker color and it uses less power. Things like that. Huh. However, there is an app, and uh, I don't. I don't. Ha- you'll have to help me out here, Father, because I don't have the notes in front of me. No, Battery Doctor. A Battery Doctor, and it's uh, by um, Cheetah Mobile. Thank you. I was about to say that. Or Cheetah Mobile. I don't know if they're from Cheetah Alabama Mobile. or not. It's a, no. It's it's a UK uh, company. Oh, but uh, it's a free Alabama. app. <laughs> it, it is a free app, and it's got a. It's got the useful tips uh, already built in. It's got monitors, so when you're charging, you can actually see what's going on. Oh, it's a, it's a really neat little app, and uh, like I say, it's free. I like those apps that kind of peel back the veil of iOS, so that you can see what's going on in the yeah. background. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really cool. Uh, Father Ryan, your your pick of the week. I uh, really, really, really like uh, organizational apps. He really does. A lot. Really. Yeah. Uh, and most of the organizational apps I've used have used the same basic method of you have some kind of board or some kind of, you know, one storage space. And then within that, within that you have a bunch of cards, you know, like all of a note cards, you know, where you can do this kind of thing. And that's generally the the metaphor that's used. And that's good for organizing to-do lists and things like that. But this new service I found called Trello, and they're not super new. I think they've been around a year or two. But I've just come across them. It's amazing in that they add a third layer. So what you have is you have an organizational kind of system like a board. And then you have cards within the board. And then each of those cards can contain multiple items in a specialized list, each of which can be labeled, assigned to other people, et cetera, et cetera. It's very Hmm. boring for most human beings, but for me, it's extremely cool. And it's allowed me to use my Eisenhower matrix and my GTD and my inbox zero. And it's all in a widget on my phone. It makes me very happy. And so if you like, uh, if you like organizational systems like this, Trello is free and it's extremely smart. Uh, And there's a lot of good articles out there like Lifehacker and stuff, how to use Trello, but it's, it's really kind of 
it's a great little service. And so I strongly recommend it for people who like me, who are nerds and or OCD. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff in it. So Trello, T R E L L O. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not OCD. I like the idea of this, but just looking at it makes me go cross-eyed. Oh my. <laughs> Uh, but, but then again, that would explain my pick of the week. Before we do my pick of the week, I need to know how to pronounce a U with an umlaut over it. Is it U? Uh? I think yeah, usually, yeah. Yeah, so so uh, my pick of the week is uh, The Journey to Emmaus by Robert Zund. Um, and it's a, it's a very famous picture, and uh, it's very bright. It's a bright picture of the uh, the two disciples, one of them named Clopas, the other one we do not know. Um, maybe because, Jeff, it was you. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, and so Jesus is walking along behind them and it's yeah. a really kind of a beautiful yeah. painting. And because this was the weekend that we re- we read, um, my favorite reading in all of scripture in the gospel, uh, I choose that painting, which is available uh, on art.com. If you want to buy one as big as your couch, uh, or as small as your puppy, uh, you can do so. And so, so that's my pick of the week, the journey to Emmaus by Robert Zund. So let us know what uh, your pick of the week is. Uh, you can do so back chat at catholicunderground.com. Father, do you want to speak briefly about the pilgrimage? Is there anything to say? We have one seat left. Wow. Theoretically, if we need to, we can squeeze two in. We're going to be going to Florence, Assisi, Rome, Orvieto, seeing the Eucharistic miracle there. It'll be October 20th through 29th. You can call 318-352-3422. That's 318-352-3422. Uh, and you can get with us right away, and we'll be happy to set you up. It should cost a little under four grand. That includes flights and most of your meals. Uh, and you can also uh, connect with uh, with us through uh, minorbasilica.org if you have questions. But it'll uh, it's it's right around the corner. And so if you want to come, you need to sign up right away. And the jokes with Father Ryan and myself, those are free. <laughs> Gratis. Oh, <laughs> Gratis. Ah, yeah. Ah. And yeah. Uh, as, as always, uh, Jeff, we thank those who support us, don't we? Indeed we do, Father. Portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's right. Uh, for the show notes that accompany, the, accompany this episode and the podcast, uh, if you want to find out more about us, you can go to catholicunderground.com to do that. Father Ryan's church is, in fact, online at minorbasilic.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan. It's been my pleasure. Jeff Blackwell is the tech director of the CU. He's the ruling despot at the Blackwell Communications Group. He's at jeffblackwell.us, and he's on Twitter at Jeff, Jeff Blackwellis. Thank you, Jeff. There you go. It's, a, it's an honor. Whew, Kathleen Lee is the faith ninja. She joins us as she always does. Thank you, Kathleen, at KathleenYABR. Anytime, and now I'm equipped with cheese knives. That's who she is. Uh, Ed Ball is on the ball uh, with our video feed this week. And Mary Kate Taylor is an evangelist in her spare time. She intentionally misspells the names of her friends. She does. And you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs for the Catholic Underground uh, at <laughs> catholicunderground.tv. We thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We are Catholic Underground. We are Faith Gone Digital. And we, my friends, will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground.